Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. A First Nation in the Yukon is breathing a sigh of relief thanks to a recent Territorial Court of Appeal decision. That decision dismisses an appeal by the Yukon government which would have permitted mineral exploration in an area of great ecological importance to the First Nation. Sarah Connors has more. The First Nation of Nacho Nayaktan is celebrating what it says is a landmark victory. The Yukon Court of Appeal has dismissed an appeal launched by the Yukon government. At the center of the case is Sata Gay, or the Beaver River Watershed, an area of untouched wilderness on the First Nations traditional territory. In 2021, the government signed off on a mineral exploration project which would conduct exploration activities in the watershed for 10 years. That approval didn't set well with the First Nation, which does not yet have a land use plan in place. That same year, the First Nation took the government to court, decrying what they say was a lack of consultation when it came to approving the project. They won the case in January 2023. But in November 2023, Yukon government appealed, arguing the judge erred in their decision and that it did adequately consult with the First Nation. However, Tuesday's decision disagrees, stating the judge did not err. Nacho Nayaktan Chief Donna Hope said in a release, the decision shows Yukon government acted unlawfully and dishonorably by approving the project in the first place. She hopes it sparks a shift in how the territory approaches treaty implementation. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Thanks, Sarah. To Ottawa now, where a proposed Senate bill that will formally recognize the Council of the Haida Nation in British Columbia was in committee on Wednesday. It is studying Bill S-16, or the Haida Recognition Act. If passed, Canada would formally recognize the rights to self-determination and governance of the Haida Nation and recognize the Council of the Haida Nation to act on the nation's behalf. Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations Gary Ananda Sangari spoke to the Senate Committee on Indigenous Peoples about S-16 on Wednesday. If this bill is passed by Parliament, it will solidify that both Canada and the province of British Columbia legally recognize the Haida Nation as a holder of inherent rights of governance and self-determination, and that the Council of the Haida Nation is authorized to exercise and make decisions regarding those rights. Three Inu chiefs have accused the Quebec government of acting in bad faith over the Petapan Treaty. They say that more than a year has passed since the agreed upon deadline to conclude negotiations, putting the proposed treaty in jeopardy. The Petapan Treaty is between three Inu First Nations and the governments of Quebec and Canada. It recognizes their right to self-determination. Chief Gilbert Dominique of Mashtoyash said the negotiations were supposed to conclude on March 31st, 2023. But instead, Quebec reneged and imposed a new deadline. Now the province is trying to renegotiate key aspects of the treaty. The Inu reached a deal with Canada and are now working to secure that agreement. They're also requesting a meeting with Premier Francois Legault. Il ne restait que le Québec euh, au rendez-vous. Il restait là, en bout de piste, là, ce que moi j'appelle le deal économique à convenir au niveau de la table de négociation, puis qui comprend le financement de la part du Québec. Okay? Il y avait des enjeux également avec le Québec, là, euh, la notion de droit inhérent à l'autodétermination, c'est un concept qui les dépasse, qui ne sont pas en mesure euh, euh, d'accepter pour le moment. On leur demande des indications sur le fondement juridique. On ne nous donne pas de réponse à ce moment-ci. A Nunavut community's only connection to the rest of the territory was recently cancelled, forcing residents to fly south to go north. Sani Kilouac is a community of uh, about 900 people. It sits on an island in Hudson's Bay, about 150 kilometers off the coast of Quebec. Arctic Fresh started a flight service between the community and the capital of Iqaluit in 2021. Last week, the airline cancelled the service. It claims that after Nunavut government's, uh, Nunavut's government stopped subsidizing the airline in January 2023, it suffered increased financial losses. 
Residents now have to fly through southern cities such as Ottawa to access other parts of the territory. Arctic Fresh's Ryan Hagen says there were other ways Nunavut could still have supported the route. We, we feel that the GN could have, you know, could have further supported this route. I think one of the biggest, um, the biggest things that uh, the GN could have done was, was um, put, put a little bit more duty travel and, and medical travel on this scheduled flight. And um, that, that in itself probably would have supported the flight uh, quite a bit more. Um, in, this, in this particular case, we reached out to the GN on a number of um, scenarios and we had hoped that there would have been some further support uh, from the GN, but uh, we just we, we were unsuccessful in our attempts. Charges against the chief in Manitoba this week are bringing up a topic that is often the elephant in the room. The sexual abuse of children in our families and in our communities. It happens a lot, but no one wants to talk about it out in the open unless someone gets charged or sent to jail. Our Truth in Politics panel is here to discuss. Jennifer Laywitz of War Shield Consulting is in our Ottawa studio this week. And Egon Sinclair of the Winnipeg Free Press is joining us from Peterborough, Ontario. Jennifer Negon, thanks for being with us. Uh, Negon, we'll start with you. In recent years, uh, there have been at least two chiefs from First Nations in Manitoba who've been charged with sex crimes against young kids. But how widespread is the issue in Indigenous communities? During the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, one of the most horrific stories that came out with regularity uh, wasn't so much the people knew about the abuse of clergy, people who worked in the schools against young people. It was oftentimes the young people against young people abuse that was one of the most horrific things to hear. Uh, it's not something that's spoken about in our communities, uh, but it's certainly evident because it was, where did we learn this, this abuse from? Simon Fraser University uh, did a study just a couple years ago, and that study showed that approximately 50% of all Indigenous peoples interviewed Indigenous females interviewed had experienced abuse, sexual abuse in their lifetime. And for men, it was one third. Uh, the reality is that each one of us, if we have not experienced that abuse, uh, are related to, live with, married to a person who has been abused. And the reality is that it is uh, integrally a part of our lives and an integral part of our communities. And we have to talk about it. We can't have it silently in the shadows so that what happens is these continual issues that bubble up when someone is found guilty of that abuse, or in this case, uh, charged with that abuse. We have to believe survivors when they talk. And we also have to talk about this much more openly in the fact that many uh, really abusive behaviors, sexually abusive behaviors, have become normalized in our communities as a result of uh, Jennifer, an APTN investigation identified dozens of sexual abuse victims across First Nations and Treaty 3 territory in what describe, or survivors described as a, a silent epidemic. Uh, we found the, the sexual assault rate there 10 times higher in Treaty 3 First Nations than the national average. Do you think that those uh, types of numbers could be applied uh, in other areas across the country? Um, unfortunately, I do. I think, you, you know, you said the word silent epidemic, and I think as we open up the conversation more and allow survivors and people that are victims of abuse to speak out, I think we're going to hear more about it. And, you know, it is it is an intergenerational thing. It's it's cycles. That's how it works. And, yeah, I, I echo what was said earlier about how it's learned. And, unfortunately, when you don't know any different, those cycles are just repeating themselves over and over again. Neon, why is this something, uh, as we said, the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about, and how do we uh, start opening up those conversations? Uh, here's a question. How do you talk about uh, one of the most horrific acts of abuse if you're related to that person? Mm. Uh, if it's a person that you see every day in your community, if it's a person that tr carries tremendous power and make decisions on things like your housing, for example, or uh, whether you get a job or, or whether you get funding to go to university, like how do you talk about these things? Silence is an easier option, but it will take collectivity, meaning people coming together and believing one another and standing beside one another. And sometimes that involves 
uh, what's often called calling out or or bringing up people who perhaps want to deny that abuse or or people who want to continue to control that power position. But it, most oftentimes in our communities, these are done very proactively through our ceremonies and through our circles. Uh, but particularly, it must be done in a way that in the end result is resulting in a better community, not a community based in violence and banishment, but in one thinking about retribution and restoration, thinking about the ways people can come together as a result of actions like this, which can be extremely hard, but that's the heavy lifting that it takes to be a part of a community. Uh, Jennifer, your thoughts on, uh, you know, the silence around this and the, how to open up those hard discussions? I think number one, making sure that communities have the resources is incredibly important. You know, people talking about it is one thing. Um, there's obviously a distrust between First Nations and the RCMP. How do we bridge that gap to have the conversations with people in law enforcement? And also what resources are available for when and if those conversations are opened? And then after the fact, you know, the legal process has to take its course. What resources are available for people to be able to get help? But I think right now it's just making sure that people know that there's no shame in talking about what happened to you. Um, and I know that there is a lot of people that carry that shame and guilt with them to talk about their experience. Jennifer Negan, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, difficult discussion this week. Thanks for being with us. Any questions? Should you need support today, you can call to the uh, Hope for Wellness helpline 24 hours a day, seven days a week for counseling and crisis intervention at 1-855-242-3310 or connect to the online chat at www.hopeforwellness.ca and follow the links. Ripped from her family as a child, Betty Ross spent many years living a hard life, but she turned that around and is now speaking about it all in a new documentary. Her story's coming up after the break. back. A Swampy Cree elder says she spent a lot of her life hurting herself because of the treatment she endured in her childhood years. And now she's decided to take her life back. With the help of Black Badge Studios, Betty Ross is sharing her journey on the big screen. With more, here's T.R. Wheatley. I came from a world where I loved <laughs> and was loved. It's been 72 years since this Swampy Cree elder from Pimichikamek was forced to attend residential school. Now she's sharing her journey home in this 45-minute documentary called Return to the Falls. Elder Betty Ross and Tishni Gasson, Michikamak Uzi, Michikamak Nation Uzi. Betty Ross returns to Sugar Falls in between Cross Lake and Norway House in northern Manitoba for the first time since she was ripped from her family. This is a significant place for her because when she was five years old, her custom adopted father brought her here to give her life teachings from the four directions. Before the residence of school, I found my own sanctuary. Uh, and I used to go and sit on a rock. It was very secluded. It was very calm. I felt so uh, protected. I'm sitting on uh, Mother Earth, and I used to talk to the bugs, to the little animals that came, the trees, everything, nature. Pretty soon I, I, I started dancing with them, the dance of life. Looking back now, she says these teachings carried her through a hard life. She's proud of the family she raised and displays pictures all over her house. Ross never knew her own relatives. Ross first attended St. Joseph Residential School in the north and then was moved to a day school. From there in the 60s, she was scooped and forced to move south. They shipped me over here in Winnipeg. St. Joseph's, no, no, sorry, uh, Cineboy Residential School, where I graduated from in 1968 because that was my goal. Because I went through a lot of uh, atrocities in the systems. They looked down on me. She suffered spiritual, mental, sexual, and physical abuse, including a beating that's affected her entire life. Because I can't hear from my left ear to this day uh, because I tried speaking my language. This documentary is bittersweet because Ross speaks a lot of Cree. 
being able to retain her language and culture is what the director wanted to focus on. Our focus right now is to take this documentary and, and, and let it have a, an educational angle. We would love to see it for her story to be shown, this film to be eventually shown in schools across the nation, across Turtle Island, um, so, um, and, and beyond. But it's an education tool. There are some reenactments from her childhood memories, but it also shows what Betty Ross's life is like today. She recently received a Manitoba Jubilee for her life's work, including educating young children around Winnipeg. Today, in my line of work as elder in residence for Seven Oaks School Division, I am so honored to be able to have that contact with the, the, uh, the very young generation, elementary school students, because you know why? I'm allowed to be a child at their level. Ross is also greeted by community members and leadership alike in the dock. Pimichikamak Chief David Monia says the community is benefiting since she made the trip home. And she attends our community to talk to the survivors. And I think a lot of people gravitate towards her because she's so well spoken, right? And the history that she has people can relate to it. Ross and her director share this intimate moment watching the documentary one last time together. It's about to premiere in a Winnipeg theater, and after that, the plan is to start taking it to film festivals. Director Apo Erkis is a non-Indigenous person himself. He says sharing stories like this are vital to share with all races. When I hear the truths of people like Elder Betty telling her stories, how can you not be affected? How can you not, how can you ignore that? Sorry. <laughs> um, it, it affected me personally. It's time I said goodbye to this space where I suffered trauma for many years. Enough is enough. I'm going home. I'm T.R. Wheatley, APTN National News, Winnipeg. The National Indian Residential School Crisis Line is available for survivors and others who might need support. That number is 1-866-925-4419. Coming up after the break, previews of this week's APTN Investigates and tonight's Nation to Nation. Stick around. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. From the blessed land of the Gitsan Nation, Clarence Jones shared this early morning view of Gitsi Gukla. Beauty view as always. Thanks, Clarence. If you'd like to show the land in your territory, send that picture to share at aptn.ca. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, showers in 12 in Halifax, rain in 14 for Fredericton, zero in Kuduak. Six above in Maine. 17 with rain in Montreal. Showers in 16 for Val d'Or. 11 in Sault Ste. Marie. Rain in 15 in North Bay. 12 for Thunder Bay. Snow and 8 in Sioux Lookout. 5 in God's Lake. 6 for Norway House. Sunny and 15 in Winnipeg. 13 for Dauphin. 16 in Regina. Cloudy and 15 in Saskatoon. Showers in 13 in Meadow Lake, 6 in Buffalo Narrows. In Northern Alberta, 10 for high level, 14 in Grand Prairie. 16 in Edmonton, 18 for Lethbridge. 12 in Vancouver, 17 in Kamloops. 10 in Prince George, 7 for Smithers. 2 above in Old Crow, 4 for Whitehorse. 4 as well in Yellowknife, a high of six in Norman Wells. Minus three with snow in Saks Harbor. Two in Politak. Back to our Ottawa studio now where Annette Francis is standing by with a preview of our weekly political show. 
Tonight on Nation to Nation, a new report by the British Columbia First Nations Council on violence against Indigenous women, girls, and Two-Spirit people highlights the needs and priorities of Indigenous communities. It's the result of 17 engagement sessions in communities across the province. We came up with what we hope will be a plan that will be implemented and act truly actioned. And a Mohawk nutritionist discusses the link between climate change and food insecurity for Indigenous peoples. As soon as um, ecosystems are impacted by climate change, that changes um, aspects of the food system. Migration patterns, availability of plants, is soil being, um, you know, is it is it being uh, you know, flooded with salt water? There's that and more later on Nation to Nation. Thanks, Annette. APTN Investigates returns tomorrow night with the first of a special three-part series on Indigenous self-governance called Inside the Band Office. The series will examine the challenges facing grassroots communities fighting for accountability and transparency from their leadership. Here's a preview. Peter's First Nation, a small community of 15 homes nestled along the shore of the Fraser River. For centuries, its people fished for salmon, weave baskets from the roots and bark of cedar trees. It was once rich in culture, but those days are largely gone. It's now known for the number of times its band council has been to court and lost. That was my home. And I just feel like I'm an outsider, like I don't belong. And... There's a reason for that. Peter's council unlawfully denies band membership, and it's kept one side of the family in power for nearly four decades. I was part of this family and part of this band, and now all these people that, that are on the band are saying, no, you can't, you can't come back. With control of membership, the three-member council has predicted its elections. Those who control the band office control the money, and business is booming, thanks to the expansion of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. We knew a lot of discrepancies were happening during the Trans Mountain Pipeline, and so that became our main focus, where, as the evidence collected, uh, you know, chief and council were, you know, they were writing blank checks for themselves. It's been proven in court that council misused the band's money on themselves, and the courts now want to know by exactly how much. The small council is led by these two. That's Councillor Victoria Peters on the left, with Chief Norma Webb. The sisters have been in power together since 2007. Look at their shirts. Our children. Our elders. Our families. I guess that depends on what side of the family you fall on because they both continue to fight elders in court over membership. It's like a page out of Canada's colonial playbook. If Canada tried to rid itself of its so-called Indian problem, Peters has continued on with the work. Oh boy, looks good. You can catch APTN Investigates inside the band office tomorrow night, immediately following the APTN national news. That is all the time we have for your APTN national news for this Thursday. You can find much more over on our website, aptnnews.ca, or by subscribing to our APTN News YouTube page. I'm Dennis Ward, Marcy Miigwech. Thanks for being with us. Stick around. Nation to Nation is up next. Have a great night.